By age 12, my guest today was already a veteran of East L.A. gang warfare. By 18, he had seen it all. Drugs, murder, suicides, poverty. 25 of his friends had been killed. But eventually, he managed to break away from the violence by turning to reading and poetry. He's now an award-winning writer and the book, author of the book, Always Running. Luis J. Rodriguez is here. My pleasure being here. Thank you. Very happy to have you here. Well, I just want to say, you know, before I read this book, I knew that things were bad in those communities, but I didn't realize how bad. I mean, I never thought it was a, a picnic in the park, but it comes across as a very brutal, bleak way of life for the people well, in those and communities. I, and somebody had to write about it because people were living this life, people were dying, nobody was talking about it. Uh, there's a, a general idea about, like you say, how bad things are, but nobody knew the real impact, the human impact of living in that kind of reality and the kind of decisions and yeah. choices that people kind of are forced to make because sometimes it isn't a matter of I, I don't get a choice. Right. So I think it's important for people to know and the only way to do it is as graphic and as real as I could do it. Right. And the thing is, you almost get the sense, I mean, although I believe in taking responsibility for your actions and all of that stuff, you almost feel that some of these kids really didn't have a chance. And that's my point. I mean, I, I definitely believe in the responsibility part because obviously I took responsibility to leave that life. Mm -hmm. I've changed my life over 30 years where I have not done any criminal acts and, I, and all that kind of thing. But I do know that if you don't think you have choices, you mm -hmm. really don't. You have to really feel that those choices are real in your life. And for a lot of people in those communities, South Central, East LA, and very poor communities, that you get more of the limitations than the actual choices that, yep. that other people might have. What percentage of, you know, reading this book, I mean, it, it really seemed as though just about everybody was wrapped up mm -hmm. in it in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I mean, what percentage of the community and the young guys especially are women too? Right. Well, my experience in going to some of the worst communities, wherever, you know, the Bronx, South Side Chicago, is that mm -hmm. even in the poorest community, the vast majority of youth are not in gangs. And that might be hard mm -hmm. for people to imagine. So most aren't? Most aren't. Okay. I mean, it, but the level of some from 1% to 25 percent, you know, some communities really have a lot of their youth into that kind of world, but I think the majority are still able to somehow manage to make themselves um, get through this. So, well, that's yeah. what I wonder, because you talk a lot about even the protection aspect. I mean, well, granted, there are many things you talk about, the social aspect of it, but even kind of the basic protection sort of thing, where people feel as though if they don't belong to one group, they're going to get done in by the other group. But yet, if 75 percent of those kids stay out of it, how do they, I'm, I'm just curious about that, how do they manage to stay out of that then? Not to minimize yeah. what the kids are going through who are drawn into it. Well, I think kids who stay out have several things. One, strong families. It mm -hmm. really helps. Uh, two, that they have something purposeful in their lives. And sometimes it's just music, it's dance, it's sports. A little bit of sports this is why sports programs are good, because if it's no sports, that's an outlet that doesn't exist for kids. Uh -huh. But my brother, for example, who was three years older than me, could have been a heavy-duty gangster. He never got into it. Mm -hmm. He really got into sports. He was a gymnast. He loved to run. He loved to play bass and music. He found something that he could focus on, and then he and that was helpful. So I think kids have to find an environment in which there isn't that much there. Oh. They have to find ways to express themselves, to find, uh, again, their purpose and meaning within whatever they're doing that's not going to pull them into the game. Sure. Now, how did you get it drawn into this so that, as I said at the beginning, you know, by age 12, you were already... Well, you said yourself later in the book that um, by 18 you felt as though you were a, a veteran of a war yeah. and had post-traumatic stress disorder. How did you get drawn into it at such a young age? I what got very young, and I think what it was is just having come from Mexico and not speaking any Spanish, any mm -hmm. English, going into schools that had no place for us where we were literally swatted if we spoke Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, getting beaten down by other kids. You know, once you're in there, you don't speak no lang the language other kids are beaten up on. And I'm just saying from African-American kids to white kids to Mexican kids who were already here, mm -hmm. everybody beat up on you if you couldn't speak the language, to the teachers who didn't seem to care to uh, my parents who were just very frustrated, mm -hmm. very poverty, just don't know, not know what to do, angry all the time, people fighting. I just found myself in the street, found myself stealing when I was seven, mm -hmm. found myself hanging in the street, and 10 years old, my best friend killed when we broke into an elementary school. In other words, real he early fell on, through the, He was yeah, running from the sheriff and, and fell, fell through, through the, the skylight. skylight. Uh, mm -hmm. So by the 11, the gang seemed like a very reasonable thing for me to join. I mean, I didn't, now that I think about it, I wonder, well, what was it? But I, I seem to have been a broken down, shy kid, who a gang seemed to have some power that I wanted. They, they seem to scare people, they seem to be people, when there's a whole mess of you there, they seem to step out of the way. I, I had a very distorted idea about what respect and power was, and mm -hmm. I thought being in the gang would give me that. So if the world was kind of trampling on you, it was a way to fight back. So for me, it was. And again, different kids have different reasons for joining, but I know that I thought the gang was going to give me 
what I valued, some kind of respect and some kind of power, and um, I went for it. But at a certain point, the more that you saw and the more that you witnessed, um, you started to feel that that wasn't really taking you in the direction that you wanted to go. And I'm mean, assuming a part of it was just seeing so many people you knew being killed. Well, what happened is when you're young, you kind of idealize everything, and you, you fall for these things and you're willing to accept a lot of things. You start getting caught up in this web that you can't unravel yourself from. But part of you, especially if you mature, you mm -hmm. get conflicted. Why am I doing this? Why are we hurting these people? You start having feelings you shouldn't have, uh -huh. which you care for other people. When you're into the gang, you have to really suppress your emotions, your feelings, because the gang expects you to do things not to care, especially at a hardcore level. Right. And uh, doing drive-bys, how do you do that? You have to detach yourself from the people you're hurting, from the, your humanity. You, you end up becoming a little bit less human each time, and the more you get into it. And then when the drugs comes in, mm -hmm. it just kind of pulls you completely away. So I was at, at a point where I was losing my humanity. I had given myself over to the whole gang and to whatever they wanted to do. And my conflict was eventually my maturity, but also uh, even the little things that I learned from my parents, the good stuff that eventually comes to you, and then just a little bit of my humanity was conflicting me with that world that I had turned everything over to. And you, again, you say that there's really a sense of obligation or even maybe pressure, but even just obligation internally, you felt that you had to go along with, you know, with the yeah. guys when they were doing this stuff because, yeah. you know, to be there and stand by each other. And it's a kind and of, a, it's a push-pull thing. I, I gave myself over to this. So it's kind of like I chose to be part of that world. And there was a certain thing that people expected, like you never rat on nobody. Mm -hmm. So you never told anybody anything else about what was going on. You, I never told my parents. I, it was a world that we were in, self-contained. And they expect you to do certain things. Be your word, but in a certain kind of sense where if you say you're going to do something, you better do it. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna shoot somebody. You better be there the day when they're going to do it. And you're going to give yourself over to all this stuff, even if you don't feel good about it. There was that section where we were robbing, mm -hmm. this driving, and, and I said, I don't feel like doing it today. And the guy says, well, I ain't taking a temperature. Right. Like, I don't care what you feel like. We're going to do this. And so you do have that pressure, but you kind of feel like, I gave myself to this. So it's not like somebody's forcing me. It's more like, I did this. Now I have to go along with the program. That's basically what you start feeling. And then if you start saying no too many times, then you start to become then a problem. Then you're in danger, especially now again, the hardcore groups. There's always a lot of gang kids that don't always have that kind of pressure. But you have in the, every gang a hardcore group, mm -hmm. and the pressure is more intense there. And people watch what you do, and they expect you to show up to the neighborhood. And if you're not there, they, they, they will ask about you. So there's people watching what you're doing. And I put myself in that group, and it got to the point where um, I couldn't back off. And when I did finally challenge everybody, as you know, later on in the book, I did challenge the whole gang warfare. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to leave my neighborhood or the gang. I was like, hey, man, this is wrong. I thought it was stupid. I got hurt. I was almost hurt by it. They, they shot at me one night uh, because of that. Yeah. So, yeah, challenging them, and I'm not talking about the whole gang so much, but just it's always a hardcore group of guys who just kind of had a, a handle of things and were kind of leading things around. You openly challenge them. They had to really put pressure on you to, to not do that. And one of the ways is possibly even kill you. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's what happens at the hardcore level. Right, even the people you've been defending. Yeah. But we'll be right back with Luis J. Rodriguez, author of Always Running, right after this. And we are back with Luis J. Rodriguez talking about always running and gang warfare in East L.A. and really across the country as yeah. well. Um, you know, there was something actually kind of touching about this book, though, despite mm -hmm. all of the horrible violence and everything. Um, at one point when you were mixed up with, still involved in the gang, and um, you fell in love with, I think it was mm -hmm. Viviana, the mm -hmm. woman from the other side. Yeah. And I love that. I thought it was perfect because it was kind of the, you know, the love will conquer all. Sure. You know, because you had these two gangs at each other's throats. Yeah. And you, at one point, after a festival, the, the two gangs had lined up yeah. and they were going after each other. But you had followed, went off with this yeah. woman, and you, you know, she was trying to keep you with her and not go get mixed That's up with right. them. And but so it's kind of nice to it's see that there was something that could break into that. And a I bit. think that happens with gang members. I, I, the majority actually leave not by being hurt or killed out; they leave by maturing out. Sometimes they. They get married, they have a job, they start removing themselves little by little, and that's the pressures. I mean, uh, when you're in the gang, you're heavy duty, you're my homies, you're all about that, but then a girl comes along and you're like, well, wait, maybe, maybe this is more important. And I learned something about that. That's kind of like my a Romeo and Juliet story there, oh, where yep. she was an enemy uh, girl, and I was, and I used to sneak into her neighborhood, and, and I was in danger. And I think this is why she eventually broke away from me and really tried to 
hurt me really bad so I wouldn't come back. I think she was really concerned that I wouldn't make it because her brothers were heavy duty in the rival gang. Sure. But that's the story. Those are kind of stories that happens in these kind of neighborhoods, in these, in these gangs. So again, it, w it was kind of nice to see that there was still humanity. You and know, I wanted to bring that in because these are really human kids. Some of them, they seem really bad. You look at them, they, they seem cold-blooded. And, and some of them, because of their lives, they actually do have real you know, um, uh, psychological things. Mm, but because of the drugs. Exactly. And, yeah. But many of them are just human kids. They're forced to make decisions that no human kid should have to be forced. And what I like people to look at is what is that environment that forces young people to be in that world? Mm -hmm. What kind of environment do we need to have that takes them away from that? What kind of mentoring, teaching, what kind of community needs to come in? Because to me, the answer to gangs is, is looking at all the empties that these kids have mm -hmm. that they try to fill. We need to fill those empties with real community, real family, and real resources in, in the community. Well, and indeed, you became an activist and became more involved in trying to keep kids out of gangs, and that's one reason you wrote the book, yeah. I know, to keep your son out of it. Although, unfortunately, yeah, um, since me. you published the book, yeah. um, he's now in... He's now in prison, serving 28 years, and it was very the sad personal part of my life was that I did not want him going there, and he ended up there. And this is kind of the story we have to tell people. We're, we're losing many of our kids. I think that, as a society, we're can kind of a little bit very jaded ourselves. We're almost like, ah, oh, let's put these kids away. We don't care. We don't realize the damage we do when we give young people so much time and they don't get time to fix themselves, to heal. And I think that we have to really look at the healing of our youth so that they can come back and do some good in the community. I'm an example of somebody who got help somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. Somewhere somebody gave me some intellectual uh, thinking and ideas and some emotional connections and some resources. And now I can do good with what I got. What about these other young people? And what about somebody like my son when he gets out of prison? I mean, obviously, me as a parent, we're going to do everything we can so he doesn't go back. But what do we have for the, from the community that can help these young people who are coming out with no skills, no knowledge, and are being forced to kind of have to go back to prison because there's nothing out there for them? Yeah. Well, there were so many excellent points in the book. I thought, you know, there's no way we can cover it all today. But one thing that I thought was very interesting was that I had heard, you know, before that the, the police seemed to kind of stand back and let the gangs do each other in, mm -hmm. in effect. But you kind of argue more than that or show more than that. You really say that the police actively mm -hmm. got the gangs at each other's throats. It wasn't just that they stood yeah. by and watched. They, mm -hmm. they would stir things up. Yeah, and you know, when people thought that I was making this up, you know, but then ramparts happened, and mm -hmm. people realized that's just the tip of the iceberg. And then, of course, there was an, some sheriff's deputies, I think, in the Linwood uh, Sheriff's Station that were actually arrested for doing drive-by shootings and instigation of gang warfare, which I talk about in my book. And again, people thought, this couldn't be real. Now it's all coming out. I'm not saying that it's every police officer, and I'm not saying that every police station does this, it, it, but there are some very poor communities where people are thinking, you know, the way to keep control of this community is not just letting them kill each other, actually continue them, push them in that direction. There was laws and gang violence, and all of a sudden something would happen, like a police officer would take an enemy gang member and put him in our neighborhood mm -hmm. and start up again. So they well, you said it was common for the sheriff or the police to pick up somebody, mm -hmm. drop them off in the wrong neighborhood, yeah. the opposing gang yeah. member's neighborhood, force them to spray paint over yeah. graffiti that could that get them killed, yeah. and then just leave them yeah. in the middle, you know, right yeah. for having their enemies watch them do this, and, and then the, leave them there. And not only that, my son, who was in the gang in Chicago when I was living there, he, he, the same thing happened there. And is that this was an LA thing. Uh, so who knows how far it goes, and who knows how many police departments. Again, I talk to a lot of police officers all over the country. Most of them are really decent. Most of them would never think of something like that. But again, you got those poor, really intensely dense communities, and you got police officers. They get caught up in that same world. You got gang members and police officers. After a while, they become two sides of the same coin. Right. And so that's what I'm trying to point out, which is what we do. If we don't really deal with these issues at a root level, we come condemn not just the kids, but even the police who are supposedly, uh, you know, try to get the kids in line. They fall into the same trap. And that was something you argued as well at the school level, um, when you became an activist mm -hmm. in school, um, because it was a mixed school with whites and Hispanics. Mm -hmm. That you, you know, and, and the Hispanics were completely right. segregated in effect from, uh, you know, they weren't yeah. the mascots or in the clubs or organizations right. and were looked down on. And you really fought against that and, and helped to change that. But yet, one of your points was to the white students was that you don't realize it, but you're getting a second, we're getting a second-rate education, and you're getting a second-rate education, because right. they've written us both off. They've written us off, and they've written you That's off. That's a good point, because yeah. I think that people forget that as long as somebody's at the very bottom, everybody gets pulled to it. If we pick up the bottom, 
provide the resources and the wherewithal for those kids to make it. Everybody goes up. But if we have levels where at the very bottom, even if it's just poor African American and Mexican kids and nobody wants to deal with, it pulls all the schooling, all the kids, and even the white kids who think they might have a little better, they're not really that much better. And as you know, education in LA schools, for example, it's really bad. Mm -hmm. There's a high dropout rate, and even though the, the vast number of the high dropout rate is among the African American and the, and the Chicano and Latino community, you have a lot of whites that are in it. It's just not gonna, you can't just separate yourself from this. We're all caught up in this maze and in this web, and we all gotta do the way we can, so at the very bottom, gets picked up. Yep. And I think you said something like 50 percent, uh, the dropout rate was 50 percent yeah. for the uh, Hispanic or Chicano yeah, yeah, yeah. students. And I, I do have to point out that one of the principals came to my neighborhood. He brought me and a few other people back. Almost everybody in my neighborhood had dropped out. The Lomas gang, we weren't in the schools. He was one of the most courageous people and I mentioned him. I had battles with him but mm -hmm. he was very courageous that he would actually go to my neighborhood and met with us and says, I'll do what I can to bring you back if you want to go. And I was one of those people mm -hmm. which eventually got me to get my high school diploma which mm -hmm. I'm very proud of. Right. I, I don't got a college yeah, degree. Because at one but, point I was having trouble keeping track. It's like you were in school, out of school, in school, yeah, out of school. I was in and out. And, you know, and that's yeah. the other thing about this book too. You know, I realized when the, the core of the book when you were completed that portion of it, you were 18. Yeah. And then there's the afterward, which you wrote years right. later. But I thought you must have been 50 or 60. I mean, oh, all the stuff you yeah. had gone through, I was trying yeah. to track your age through the book, and I thought, well, he's got to be 20, at 30. least 50 now. You know and what? you were 18. This it was is an really important point that you can go through a very, very and tremendously upheaval period as a youth. Uh, this was most of my, my most intense period of my life. I was a heroin addict. I was in the streets. But you know, when I, you can save kids too, when they're eight, late teens, early twenties. If you come in there, even mm -hmm. if they've done these terrible things, they're they're still malleable. We can still do things with them. Their psyche's malleable, their brains. But we have to come in there. And I was one of those people that made changes early on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I, I I did not do a heavy, big heavy duty prison jail term, which is why it bothers me that my son is having to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I let go heroin eventually, young enough where I could uh, get back in this world and try to raise a family and do what I needed to do. But uh, I think that that's my point. We can still help these kids. They're writing off teenagers like crazy, mm -hmm. trying them as adults. When you, you can't do that, you, there's still a chance to do some good with these kids. And, and you would yeah. work with the school, so that yeah. instead of just kicking these kids out, that they would talk to them Bring first, them in, instead and of just try, automatically yeah, exactly. expel them. You, and, you, you kick kids out, and what? They're more of a danger outside than they are inside. Well, when you had mentioned the, the drugs, and, and when you had reached a low point where you were sniffing gasoline yeah. out of um, bulldozers or yeah. something on construction sites and everything, you had a near-death experience exactly. and or may have been on the verge of suicide at that point? I think it was all suicide. I didn't quite know it. Uh, I think that I really didn't want to live. My attitude was the only meaningful thing was if I died for the gang, when that included old Dean in the streets, whatever it was, that was the most meaningful thing. And I was actually pissed off with my friends. Yeah, one of them gave me Ross the Mouse resuscitation, brought me back. I was angry. It's like I didn't want to come back. I really wanted to just float away into this escape. And that's the way the feeling was. And I used to stand in the street corners and write the bullets, do the hand sign, scream out the body or name, and come get me. I, would, I, I wanted to die. I've been, I was shot at six different occasions, including machine gun fire, point blank range, and I just wasn't hit. And it wasn't my doing, you know. Uh, we can say the creator was watching out for me. You can say whatever you, you think it is, but the point was I tried really hard to die. And I wasn't dying, and here all my friends were dying. So I felt extremely bad that I wasn't going away. And in fact, that one incident where I even thought I could cut my, th my, my wrist, that might be one way of doing it. But still, that wasn't meant for me. And now that I survived it and I came through it, I realized, well, then I'm responsible to do some good with what I've been given. Something has been given to me, and I, and I want to do that. That's, that's what I've been trying to do all these years. Yeah, and that was very striking, too, that when you were talking about, you know, again, on the one hand, you're watching all these kids be mowed down around you, but yet, not just you, but um, a couple of people you knew either killed themselves or mm -hmm. tried to kill themselves. And so you think, you know, the, the, the ones that did get through it, you know, did themselves in because of everything yeah. that they I mean, saw. I think this is what happens to people, just the self-hatred, the, the pain of isolation, the pain of detachment. Eventually, people don't realize how lonely kids can be. And you know, the thing about youth, it's just not a poor... Chicano radio experience, almost all kids, white kids, poor kids, they're all going through something terrible. Well, we will be right back with Luis J. Rodriguez, author of Always Running. <music> we are back with Luis J. Rodriguez talking today about Always Running, about gang warfare in East L.A. and the rest of the country as well. Uh, you know, one of the sad things about this, I think, when you're reading the book is that you realize that it's 
basically this community tearing itself apart. You had, well, I know you changed a lot of the names, but I think you yeah. said that the gang names were actually were real. Yeah. It was uh, Lom Las Lomas and Sangre were the two main gangs. So. Right. Yeah. But the situation, when I was thinking about this after I read the book, and I, people don't make this connection, but it occurred to me, I thought, you know, this sounds like the Middle East. It sounds like Israel versus Palestine. I think that there's a point there. Yeah. Where, and there it's, you know, people tell you, oh, it's religion, it's power, it's oil, and I thought, wait, this is East L.A., yeah. two Hispanic groups fighting each other to the death, yeah. and it's the same vendetta, yeah. tit for tat, eye for eye yeah. kind of mentality that you get in these other places in the world. Yeah. And I think what happens with kids is they incorporate what we teach them, believe it or not. I think what happens in that bigger world, in that world that we don't think is going to impact them, that if we go to war to resolve our issues, that's what kids do. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's some of our, the big decisions that are being made at that level. is very similar to what a mentality that a kid would have. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm trying to say? And I was amazed that even in the Persian Gulf War and in the last war, the Persian Gulf War in particular, I remember when they used to do those, those bombings that you could tell, you could see, and I called them mm -hmm. the great drive-bys. They yeah. almost felt like the same thing. We mm -hmm. didn't have to see the faces of the people we were hurting, their suffering. They were just enemies, and we could blow them away. And I thought, well, that's what I used to feel when we used to go do drive-bys. Yeah. I didn't think about them as people. They were enemies. They were just like me. They looked like me. They had mm -hmm. issues like me. Their mothers cried like my mother would cry. And yet, I never felt that. And I think we get to the point that we have that kind of siege mentality that you yeah. can go at the highest levels to the lowest levels. We end up teaching these things to these kids. They're doing what we have taught them to do. So how do you break out of that cycle of violence? You know, again, just as in the Middle East or something, you get a thing where one group does one thing, so you have to retaliate and to show that, you know, you're not going to put up with that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. And then the other side does the same thing. And it's the same thing with the, the gang yeah. mentality. And at one point, you stood up and said, you know, no, look, I'm not going to. You didn't. You thought maybe the sheriff had actually done one of the shootings that people right. were going to retaliate for, mm -hmm. trying to stir something up. Of course, the rest of the gang members basically, I think, wrote you off at that point. Yeah. But, but how do you break through that? Because again, yeah. well, I think of what um, somebody from one of the, the, act, the social workers, in effect, yeah. who worked in the community, held up the globe of the That's earth to right. you and said, you know, here's, you know, show me what you're it's fighting right. over on this globe. And, and you couldn't even find, like, the little that dot. That was a very big step. And that was, like, to expand my imagination. To me, that's how I work with the kids. To, they have a very limited imagination. And you know, so does the government, and so do these kids. They're, limit, they're limited, and I say, look, let's expand our imagination. Let's expand the options that we have here. Let's imagine other ways to go. And as long as you're limited in your imagination, violence grows from that. Because violence is one of the, the things that happens when you have no imagination. So I work a lot with the imagination. I think the creative imagination is really the way out of chaos. And it's really the way out of the, the uncertainty. So education. It's education. Mm -hmm. And you have to be skilled. You have to be knowledgeable. You have to have words. Mm -hmm. Language is important. Well, as long as we didn't have language and no control of language, we didn't really have any personal power, let alone political power. So all those things were important. And that's the kind of work I do. How do you give young people the tools, the means, but also the language and the words and the poetry for them to live out their lives in a way that's purposeful, meaningful, and peaceful, that they won't have to just hurt people when things don't work out? Yeah, I think one phrase you used was, you know, you have to have collective action and a plan. Mm -hmm. But part of that plan, too, you said, though, you know, that I unless you, this is what you get unless you have recreation, jobs, yeah. and education for these I mean, people. Here's I mean, here's the thing. You get these gonna... kids and you say, okay, don't join a gang. Okay, give me the other option. What's the, buy, what's the other alternative? We don't got one, but don't join a gang. Hmm. It doesn't work. You know, are you, okay, do you, is there a decent organization that I can join that's actually healthy and balancing and teach me something and there, there are very few. Is there a job I can have so I can have some money coming in? Mm -hmm. If not, I'm going to sell drugs. A lot of kids only want to sell drugs. It's very, you know, it's kind of hard work. People don't think it's that hard, but you're risking your life. You're going to get jailed. Who knows what's going to happen? Why would you do it mm -hmm. unless there was something more viable? And, that's and you were what trying we were to find jobs, but a lot of yeah. times you couldn't really And I think that's what we got to look at. We have to create a viable alternatives to these things. Gangs exist within certain conditions. If we change those conditions, they're not going to exist. But if we don't want to go there, we don't want to take the risk, we put all the pressure in the back end. We put billions of dollars in prisons, billions of dollars in, in more law enforcement, and, we're, and that's all back end stuff. The front end is being neglected, and this is why we're even contributing to keeping the, the, the problem massive, because we don't do the front end things. Well, thank you very much for being here today, it's Luis. My pleasure. I really thank appreciate you. it. That's great. Thanks, Thanks, everybody, for watching. The book is Always Running by Luis J. Rodriguez. Very powerful book and subject, and wish you well with all of your work. With thank the you youth. so much. And Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.
I knew that things were bad in those communities, but I didn't realize how bad. I mean, I never thought it was a, a picnic in the park, but it comes across as a very brutal, bleak way of life for the people well, in those and communities. Well, and somebody had to write about it because people were living this life, people were dying, nobody was talking about it. <laughs>